So our purpose at, the, at this point is to create, you know, some fields, and I type in a name, and I just want to save the name and display it on screen like that. So we're seeing that I can do that. I'll show you the code in a moment. But again, this is, this is almost like when you work with like the more complex stuff, suddenly, well, how do you do it again, basically? So that's what I was kind of tripping myself up on. A uh, couple of things. I accidentally, if you followed me exactly, I typed 211 here. It's 221, isn't it? In the folder, we've got jQuery 2.2.1. Dot one. I accidentally typed for some reason a 2.1.1, so make sure your line 18, just to confirm in my flash drive, I've got 2.2.1. For some reason I wrote 2.1, so that's a problem. Line 18, make sure it's 2.2.1. And what I was getting at over here about creating this variable, just ignore that for the moment and whatever I had there. Let me explain what I've got in line 22. We were trying to do, okay, there's a button on screen called BTN add class. When we click it, do something. And the end result is this function here, which is really big. So again, you don't have to type this right now. We're not actually going to use it. But what's happening here is an anonymous function that basically on the results div on screen. So I've got a reference to it right there in, in the jQuery dollar ID, etc. We're going to write some HTML into that div. What HTML? Well, in the CRN field, give me its value. And there's all of these redundant open and closings that are necessary. Again, this, if you want to type this just to make sure it works, you can. I'm not going to have you do this because this is like so far back basic just does it work yes it works but uh, I want to add it into the database and all of that so I'll give you a quick moment if it works good if not don't worry because we're gonna get more complex but the point of this is that I just type something into the first field and then I click the button to save it and then it'll display on screen and this is all jQuery working right here. Again, we've got what object are we dealing with? The div results object. We're going to write some HTML. So this is that open and close parentheses that go out over here. And then we've got in here, actually, I think I've got those redundant. Anyway, then we've got these over here. There's a field on screen. This is only going to show one field the CRN field, and give me the value that's in that field. Um, whatever you type into that field, it has a value. I want to get that value and then display it on screen. So this is anyway, this is just going to be a sort of like little test. If you don't type it in, that's fine. I'm going to leave it as a comment in my code in a little bit, but if it does work, it's simply going to be if I type CRN123, save class, it displays on screen. If you came in a little late, if you came in a little late, make sure you change your line 18 to be 2.2.1. My mistake is 2.1.1. It's 2.2.1. <coughs> this variable that I was about to play with, just delete that, delete line 21. It's not doing anything. We were going to create a variable to store the field, but like why we can just display it on screen quickly again uh, this line 21 this is just a quick test I'm gonna comment it out also I'm not really gonna use it uh, if it worked great if not I, I need to move on uh, but the concept is that there's a field I wanna press a button give me the value of that field display it on screen so there's a button on screen click it there's a field on screen give me its value display that in the div we're going to do this for real in a, in a moment, but 
what I want to do is get to it where, okay, that's a parlor trick. Display that on screen. I want to really, you know, save this data in the database and all that good stuff. So after that line, on our line 22, we'll do VAR DB. We're going to create our database equals new pouch db. Notice how that's spelled. It has to be spelled that way. This, this particular object here, it's defined in the specification of the pouch db library, line 19. It has to be this way. And then open close parentheses semicolon. And what you have to tell it inside of the parentheses is the name internally of our database. The user will never see this. We hardly work with this value anyway here but we need to give it some sort of value and we're going to call this in quotes SDCE classes. So I commented out the previous line, don't worry about it. This is where we're going to get started for real. We're creating a database. Okay, so I found here for our <coughs> testing purposes, I like the Google Chrome console a little better than Firefox. Although like we saw in the documentation, now they have an extra little extension that helps you manage your databases better. I'll look into it, but I like the Google Chrome console. So. We're going to save this, and now we're going to start to get used to running it in Chrome. We get similar results in Firefox, but I like the results in Chrome better. They make a little more sense to me. Uh, let's just see if this works so far. Run Chrome. When you launch Chrome, press F12. I want to pull up the console. You've got the console, this is Chrome, and I don't have any errors. If you do, I'll check it in a moment. But my point here is we did have a command here, var, create a new pouch database. We're going to see all of the data in our database within the console, the developer tools, actually, because we're going to look inside of this sources screen. We've got elements, which is all of our HTML structure, console, which are our JavaScript errors and such. Let's look at sources. Sorry, not sources. Resources, sorry. Yeah, sources, and I mean resources. It might be hidden under the double arrow. Go to resources. If you don't see that, you're in Firefox. Open up Chrome, and then in resources, this is where we can look at all the cookies that our website is saved, session storage, local storage. Remember we talked a little on local storage, that HTML5 way to save basic data. And then we've got WebSQL and IndexedDB. We don't have anything on WebSQL, but on IndexedDB, we have a few drop-downs here. If you open that little drop-down, SDCE classes. Underscore pouch underscore SDCE classes. If that var worked of new pouch, you should see this. If not, raise your hand. Did it? Did you not get that pouch? There? Okay. Let me pull my code back up. Make sure you've got line 19 and line 22. This is just to check. It created database. Our resources page should show that. Well, 
Now, uh, so obviously here, uh, you guys are all rusty. Spring break was too too much party. Uh, 
too much party during spring break. All right, so this is just to show this one simple command is we're creating a pouch database. And where we're actually seeing it, it's right here in the browser, where we have this resources. They've got sources and resources. They've got resources. And here is where it's, this is where you would see all your cookies. So if you poke in there, you're, when you browse websites, you're going to see all the cookies stored in there. For us, for all intents and purposes, we internally, all deep behind the scenes, the deepest level, this is technically an indexed DB type of database. Uh, when, when the powers that be were trying to develop a, a web-friendly database, because MySQL maybe wouldn't cut it or Oracle wouldn't cut it, people wanted to create a web-friendly HTML5 compliant web database, two factions rose up, web SQL and index DB. So that's again, which is standards are great, but everyone can make a standard. So PouchDB will just work however it needs to work, but internally in uh, Chrome, it's saving it as an index DB type of database. And if we then see here, we've got this database called SDCE classes now. Don't do this, but if I were to go in and change it and say my SDCE, my SDCE classes and run that, Again, don't do this. You would see that my resources would now show that I've got another database. Two databases. So I can create as many of these databases as I want, and each one is independent data compared to the other, and it can store as much as, as you want to store into it. So it's just simply new PouchDB. It's got a database and all of the features that it has. If you then uh, thought about clicking on it, it'll give you some info here. Not a, not a lot of useful info, but it's that deep down internally, it's also prefaced with underscore pouch, underscore. And then this has got a little triangle to click on that opens up with a bunch of stuff in here. Here's different ways to actually look at the data in the database by sequence or document and such. There's nothing in the database yet, so this is nothing really important to look at yet. But in here, for example, if you jump to by sequence, this is going to show us key value. Remember, the whole thing about this database is it's just keys and values. So we'll be able to see the database here. This is how we're going to be debugging it. Am I saving the data? Am I saving the data that I think I'm saving? <laughs> so as I said now, over on PouchDB.com, it says that there's a brand new extension that'll let you see this data easier. I want to look into that later on, but here's how we're going to do it in Chrome. And Firefox version is similar, but I like the way this one shows it. So this is just to show you. Here's where we're going to see our data if we're, if we're on the right track. It looks like we all are, because we do have a database that was saved. Um, back to our code. We've created a database. Next line. Now we're going to deal with, okay, we're going to press a button, and I want to capture all of that data that the people are typing in. So we'll go back to typing this jQuery right here, uh, btn add class again, on click. Function. We'll do that skeleton again, and then we'll make it work. Just go ahead and type that. If this one worked up here, you can copy and paste it, but I just recommend type it again. Uh, the button is going to get clicked, and we'll do something. <coughs> A lot of things are going to happen after that button click. We need to check. Uh, what's in all of those fields, save all of those fields temporarily, build a document, <coughs> build a pouch document based on auto, all of those separate fields. We're going to unify them all into one document, and then that document, put it into the database. So that will require multiple steps. So it's a good idea here then, in this function, to run a, you know, a defined function that has all of our steps. So we'll say add classes function. When we click the button, run the add classes function, which will have many steps. On the next line, of course, we will define what does add class 
add classes function actually do. This is not PouchDB, this is not jQuery, this is not JavaScript. We're making this up because we need to do many steps. We're going to bundle all those steps together into a function we will invent on the next line. Function, add classes, open close parentheses, open curly brace, close curly brace. Now we're going to get uh, we're going to write literally like over 100 lines of code to make all of this work in this yes. test in this test file. So I do want to start to incorporate comments in this thing. At the end of our line 26 or so at the end of our function here, I'm going to write a comment that says end <coughs> add classes. Because when we're going to probably add like 30 lines of code just in this, 50 or something. So we're going to end with lots of code. I'm going to lose track of what I'm working with. So I'm going to create a function and then it's going to end. Just a little comment for myself. This is the end of that function. Inside the function, line 25, we need to have some temporary variables to store those three fields where someone typed something into. We'll type VAR. And I don't believe I've mentioned it before, maybe, but we can create multiple buttons, uh, multiple variables at the same time. For example, I could create a variable called something, and then another variable called something, and another variable called something. A more efficient way is if we do VAR, comma, variable, comma, variable, comma, and create many variables and then end it. So we say var once and we create multiple variables. Same thing as var this, var that, var this, var that. But we're going to kind of do a little shorthand here, separated by commas. So we want a variable called class, crn. These are all of the fields that will define um, one document. One document is made out of those three fields. Space equals. I'm going to define the variable and fill it with what the person typed on screen. <coughs> Dollar. So we'll have our jQuery selector here. And we've got the field up here. What did we call it again? CRN field. Pound CRN field. dot value dot sorry dot val open close parentheses this is jQuery jQuery basically is the same give me the value give me what a person typed in this field and then put it into this variable comma we need to then do the same thing for the next field and I'm just going to break this up, comma, enter, and tab it. Just for readability, we can run it in one line, of course, but don't forget that comma. It's not a semicolon. I'm not done yet. Comma. Now we've got class title, or class name. And the same thing, dollar, quotes, pound, class field, dot val, method. So I didn't say var again because I'm chaining it with the comma. I'm creating more than one variable at once. We need one more variable, comma, at the end of that line. And this one, uh, class instructor in INST, the third input box, which we call inst field, give me its value, and now a semicolon. I'm done with that one statement of var.
I want to see if this is working so far by putting some console output. Console.log class CRM. We'll just do it very quick and dirty. And yeah, we'll do it like this. Console.log class name console log inst class inst this uh, should be enough save it and run it put some stuff into those fields click that submit button that save button check your console this is not a displaying out to that div yet should hopefully then Give you into the give you console output to whatever you typed, and when you type something new and save it again, it should put it to new to the console again. Let me check my code. So uh, let me check if it works for you. But uh, the concept is that if it uh, if you type just stuff into those fields and click save, this should appear in the console and type something else. Save and it should come out. <coughs> Don't worry about putting anything meaningful yet. I should just get some output to my console. Let's pause here. Did that raise your hand if it worked? Okay, anyone need a little help? Here's my code so far. Anyone need some help?
more cases. We're not using the cases on the first thing. All right, so the point of this is to see that we have a mechanism so that when someone types in anything into these fields, we're capturing them. Then we're displaying it in the console. We're on our way. Now, if you do reset, that should clear them out. It would be nice that when we type into these and save it, they clear themselves out. We will be able to do that, of course. We'll be able to do whatever we want here. Uh, but let's say also, at the moment, technically our input fields can gr grab any kind of data. Right now we've set it to, to the type of text. Right up here we've said input type text. We have the ability to say input type equals number, and technically it should only accept numbers. We can even do, I think, type tel, T-E-L, and it'll only accept telephone numbers. I think there's also a brand new HTML5 one of type equals email, and it will only let you put in an email. So the cool thing about HTML5 is it's refining some of these plain old input fields to only accept certain data. We'll deal with that a little bit later, but what I want to do is guide people. I want to guide people on what to type here. I want to type some placeholder text here on my input fields. So let's back up 
to lines 10 through 12. That's where we've got our input fields. We've got type and we've got name and ID. After type, let's start with line 10. After type of text, let's type the attribute placeholder. And this, so this is placeholder text that will appear in the input box to guide people what to type. Later on, we'll have stronger, you know, data, um, uh, data checking and such. But right now, we'll say placeholder in the format, you know, a, a CRN. I want it to be like eight eight zero one x whatever. So this is like guiding them. Type a CRN like this placeholder. I'm going to do the same thing. I want to add a placeholder also to the next input field. Uh, this is asking for a class name. This can be anything. So this will be Android 1. And I can put spaces and caps and so forth because this will just display text on screen. And then I want a placeholder for the instructor's name. So again, I can decide this is helping to guide people what to type here because these fields right now are very very basic they can type anything they can type a sentence here if they'd like with with symbols and numbers and everything but for the moment i want to guide them by just you know placeholder and then just last name we can have it store anything but we'll just guide them to say just last name first name last name they can take whatever we want but we'll just guide them this way and the point of this is to then when you see it, I need to get out of the habit of running Firefox. Uh, when you run it, you're going to see it as a little placeholder there. So it's guiding people of what to type. Placeholder. Question? Yes. So you, uh, you save that and save the class. You mean these placeholder values? Yes. I don't believe these do anything. No, they're still invisible. They're not saving anything. All right, so what we want to do is now uh, take these three separate pieces of data and bring them into one document. So we'll go back to our code. We'll go back to add classes. Next line. We're going to create a new variable. We'll call it a class. This is a variable that holds the data of one class. And this is made out of equals. This is made out of a JSON object. Curly brace, close curly brace. These three pieces of data that I'm collecting, I want to string them all together into this one JSON object. And then when I've got this, I'll put it into the database, just like the example we saw in the Pouch website. So because we know we're going to put this into Pouch, <coughs> we need the field of ID. So in quotes, underscore ID. It has to be named like this. Every document in Pouch needs an ID. Space, colon, space. Okay, what's the data we're putting into this field? Well, we've just captured class CRN, whatever the person typed. Class CRN. That one's not in quotes, because if it was in quotes, it would be a string. It would be literally class CRN, not, what the, per not the number the person typed. So in this case, no quotes. Even though we've been using on our JSON practice previously quotes around everything, you should realize here we don't want quotes around this because we don't want a string. We don't want exactly the value class CRN. We want what's in the variable class CRN. And we've got comma, enter, quotes. The next field is um, title, the title of the class which is class name, comma. And lastly, we've got, we'll do inst. Class inst. 
no more comma, that's the end of our serialized data. That's the end of our JSON, of our JavaScript object. Next line, console.log a class. Show me, show that to me in the console. Show me the data strung together as an object. So lines 31 to 35, it's one variable, one, one object, one variable that we've created, that we've strung together all three of those pieces of data, those three, those 30, those 90 pieces of data, whatever, those fields. These are all the fields of this record, this document. This is the document that we're going to put into pouch. We've strung them all together as a plain old JSON syntax. So be careful here again, comma. Comma, no comma. And our syntax here, and then colons. And let's uh, check our result. Open up your console, put something in again. Just don't worry about what you put in, just put something. Save class. It's still going to show you that plain old console output here, and then it's going to show you an object. The ID, the title, and the inst. When I got that, I got a whole drop down menu from the ID in structure. That might be okay. I think the browser might show you slightly differently. Do you guys see a big difference from my output? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, go back to your. You may go through an ID. We need to have ID time and inst. Oh. Yes. This object, is that just generic object that you can name it at some point? It's generic object because it's seeing that this is, it's seeing that it's a type of object. All right, so uh, here I'm just showing that I'm running all of that together as, or grouping all of that together as one object. Uh, once we've got that, then we can uh, put it into the database. So next line, db dot put, open close parentheses, And the documentation tells us, okay, when we're trying to put something into the database, we can put it in a variety of ways. And two things might happen. Positive result, negative result. <laughs> that it doesn't go in for various reasons, and why. Or that it does go in and then do something about it. So those are, those are our arguments that we put in here. The first one is, okay, what are we putting into the database? A class put that object full of all of these three pieces of data into the database, all grouped together as one thing. Comma. There's, a, there's now here this result. Uh, the result of, um, of trying to put it in, it's either negative or positive. So uh, what comes after this is function. Callback. Open close parentheses. And then open close curly brace. This syntax looks very similar to what we've seen over and over. On click, function. Uh, on device ready, function. 
this is the exact same thing, and technically we could have simply done it as we've done it over and over and over, like that function, anonymous function. Here, I'm just getting you used to thinking this is a callback. There is a result of uh, putting it in. And specifically, again, I'm saying there could be an error or there could be a result. So doing it this way also allows us to then say, what do we do with the error data and what do we do with the good data? Built into pouch, again, is a result, either an error or a good result. So what this is going to have inside of these parentheses is error, comma, result. These can be named anything, and the documentation is a bit not consistent here and there. Sometimes they call it error, E-R-R. -R. Sometimes they call it error, result. Sometimes they call it data, and sometimes they call it result. These values don't matter. It could be kitties, comma, cat. That'll work. It's just whatever those two things are called there, that's the data that we're getting. Built into put is a result, either an error or a result. In that order, basically, either an error or a result. We're getting a callback, a result. Um, if I get an error, okay, give me perhaps some console output to figure it out. And if I get a positive result, do something about that. So this line here, actually, I'm going to break it up into multiple lines. Um, so be careful here. I've got the open and close curly braces, and then I'm going to break that closing curly brace down to the next line like that. So after the curly brace, enter to break it over here, end curly brace, end parenthesis, which goes back to put end of line, end of statement, of db.put. If you tab that, and here we can make the decision. There's either an error or there's either a result. Decisions. We talked about that a little bit. If, else statements. If there's an error, deal with that. If there's no error, deal with that. So we'll start the if skeleton. Because here we again we have either the error or the result. If there's an error, do that. If there's no error, do this. Um, so we'll do here exclamation point error. This exclamation point means not. So if there's no error, yes, you could have said results. There's many ways to do this, of course. But just to think about it this way, because sometimes using the negative version of something could be useful. We're saying here, if there's no error, do the part inside of if. Well, if there was an error, do the part inside of else. The reason we're doing it like this is because if we check if good result, uh, that'll be the first part. The else will be the error. Same thing. It's just a different kind of way to think about it. Sometimes uh, it works this way mentally. Sometimes it can be done another way. It really doesn't matter. I want to do it this way just to uh, kind of get different ways to do it. Uh, but here, if we didn't get an error, that means we did manage to save the data to the database. So then now what I want to do is display on the screen to the user, success. We did save the data to the database. So onto the screen, we've got an object on screen, don't we? We've got a div called results. We've got a div on screen. We've got that div placeholder results. Be careful, we call it results plural, 
not result. And into that div, I want to write some HTML, a quick HTML message, class saved. This is saying if there was no error, tell the user class saved. If there was an error, let's copy that line and paste it into the else portion and we'll say simply error. And then to the developer, to ourselves, Let's give ourselves a more meaningful error. error. When we try to put data into the database, it will give us back a result. And that result is stored in a temporary variable called error or result. So show me, what is Pouch trying to tell me? Show that to me in the console. We could put, we could make it say error right here. Notice it's in quotes because it will be a string. But if I only say it as error, this will display to the user. It'll display some gibberish developer error message that th will scare the user. That's why I'm just simply for the user saying error. But for us and the developer, yes, give me the bloody details in the gory details in the console. As a matter of fact, I want to see well what happens. I'm going to copy that console log error and display it up on the no error result. Pouch is trying to tell me something also if it worked. Pouch is trying to tell me something in that result temporary variable. So show it to me in the console. To the user, show a nice happy message, but to me, show me some you know scary developer's message. And then if if there is a if there is an error, show me the scary error here. <coughs> show the user just a quick little error. Let's see if this works. Let's go ahead and save it and run it. I'm going to pull up my console first of all. No errors in the console. Good. I'm going to just put in some stuff. Again, doesn't matter just yet. Save class. I get the usual output, but a brand new line here. Object. OK. True. ID. And a revision. So what's displaying there is line 40. Right here, line 40. What's the result that Pouch is kicking back to me? It's displayed in the console. And on screen it says class saved for the user. And what it gives back to me is an object. JSON, there's the curly braces, of OK, a field OK set to true, a field of ID, which is what I typed in the ID, and revision. This is the first version of that piece of data, of that document, with this unique identifier. I'm going to type in something else, just to make it easy. 999, 888, 777. Save that. The user says class saved. And then internally it says, okay, true. You saved it to the database. You saved object with ID of 999 and its own unique identifier right here, 76FF. This one's 5FCA. That's working. If it didn't work for you, I'll help you in just a moment. But, okay, let, let me force an error message. I'm not going to change anything here, and I'm about to save, well, let me save class 999 again with this data. I'm going to try to save again class 999. I've already saved class 99. Let's save that. Error. What's the error? Status, blah, 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 name, conflict, message, document, update, conflict, error, true. So Pouch is kicking back to me some JSON data. A JSON object, 
with a status of 409, a name of conflict, a message of, document update conflict, and an error of true. So I'm trying to reuse the same ID more than once. That's an error. And so that's what displays on in my console. On screen, it's just simply error, because this would be scary for the user. And I can display just this message, because all of these are separate fields. And to the user, I could display this message. But that's still <coughs> going to be confusing for the plain old user. Document update conflict? That's not going to be very useful for regular people. So here I've shown you a positive result, a negative result. If I simply change this now to x, save it, the user says class saved, internally, OK, true. Let's pause here. Let's take a break, actually. Let's take a break. How many of you did this work for? Raise your hand. A few people. Good. Let's take a break. I'm going to put my code in the network folder at this point, if you'd like a copy of it, and then I'll do some help, and then we'll We'll proceed. It's 8.33. Let's take a 10-minute break. We'll be back at 8.43.